uh, all for this opportunity to, to really highlight some good news, some remarkable partnerships, remarkable people, and try to put a human face on some of the work that uh, collectively uh, many of you that are joining us have been doing and so many others have been advancing. It's a collective cause of meeting a moment, a moment of tremendous stress and anxiety, a moment punctuated uh, by this current crisis, this health crisis in the state of California, but a moment that nonetheless uh, has also um, you know, been exposed. And that is these trend lines that have been well-defined not only in our state, but in our country have become headlines in terms of reconciling the issues of wealth and income disparity and all the existing and pre-existing conditions as it relates to equity. And it relates to the issues of race and ethnicity in the context of our health and in the context uh, of our economic prospects in this state. And so we are really pleased to be here uh, with folks that not only get it, but have gotten a lot done that are committed to the cause of reconciling these disparities, not just identifying these issues, but actually rolling up their sleeves and doing something uh, formative and substantive about it. And I couldn't be more pleased uh, that we're doing something that's relatively novel. I'm not aware that the state in the past has particularly been as focused on philanthropy and developing partnerships, not just the old public-private partnership, but really developing public-public partnerships, beginning to connect dots between state agencies and local agencies, uh, governmental agencies and non-governmental agencies, uh, philanthropy and business, and beginning to address issues uh, in a much more systemic way and a much more aligned way. Of course, none of that could happen without a framework of intentionality, a framework of focus. And I am just so blessed. We had an idea during this transition when I got elected a couple of years ago to bring someone in the office that can begin to connect those dots. And I'll be honest with you, having been mayor of San Francisco, where we attempted to do something along those same lines, we had some early success, but we didn't necessarily see that success sustained over a good deal of time. Often I thought about the effort uh, when I was mayor of being something that was on the natural already happening. And we were frankly just highlighting on things that were already drafting in the right direction. Um, and I wasn't necessarily as convinced, I'm being fully honest and disclosing my thoughts that, that this could truly amplify um, and truly bring to scale uh, a strategy that, that we can really address and advance uh, causes that we had it in the past. Well, I'm completely disabused of that pre uh, position uh, of two years ago because I've seen firsthand the incredible work uh, Kathleen has done and this new senior advisor role around social innovation. Uh, she has proven herself and she has really enlivened my, well, my senses, my belief system and my capacity in terms of expectation and engagement uh, with many of you that are watching, many of you that we'll be hearing from in a moment. And so if it sounds like I'm uh, not just bragging on all of you that are ones actually doing the hard work, I wanna just brag on our senior advisor, Kathleen, for just really doing a remarkable job of connecting dots and, and dots that now have connected close to $4 billion uh, just in the last, uh, well, less than two years uh, that we've been able to pull in formally. I honestly would not have happened had it not been for Kathleen and in reaching out to many of you that we'll be talking to in a moment. Of course, none of it, none of this would happen without you. But Kathleen, to connect those dots at a moment where we all need to be connected more than ever to this collective cause of reconciling the moment we're living in. And so I'm really proud of her, this senior uh, role, the work she's done to connect all our state agencies together as well. Uh, but 20, well, I think we're what, 27 high profile partnerships. And, and that is not just, that's not the whole story. She'll talk more about all the sub partnerships that have been developed in the hundreds and hundreds of uh, partnerships between business and philanthropy that lie underneath those 27 larger partnerships. But on the issue of homelessness, issue of housing, the issue of making sure we're there regardless of your immigration status, that we're truly inclusive in a California for all 
framework, focusing on the issue of contact tracing, addressing head on the challenges associated with food scarcity in this pandemic induced recession, addressing the issues of healthcare uh, more broadly defined and taking care of our caregivers. I mean, just one of the things, and I hope by the way, and I'll end in just a minute, hope everyone does take a look at this remarkable report where you can see uh, the details of all of these partnerships. And I was reminded of something I shouldn't need to be reminded of because it was such a wonderful thing when we were able to announce it a few months back at one of our weekly press conferences. But those $500 debit cards we handed out to those that were working in our residential care facilities, our caregivers that were sleeping in their cars because they were scared to go back home in the midst of the COVID crisis in the beginning of this pandemic and expose their family members uh, that were literally living on friends or neighbors' couches. But we were able to get those debit cards so they get a hotel room. The hotel rooms themselves that philanthropy was able to advance to help us stabilize individuals. Uh, it just, you know, I can go on and on. It just, it's a remarkable thing that, to see it all. You kind of don't, you take a lot for granted in the moment, but to see it all distilled in this report just really makes me proud and, and proud of the folks that Kathleen is going to introduce and I'm going to have the privilege of dialoguing with. And, and as I talk to each of you individually, I'll also highlight your extraordinary contributions. But again, first, I just want to pass it on uh, to Kathleen. Again, thank you, Kathleen, for inspiring all of this, inspiring this moment where we're joined together. And thank you again for just incredible work you've done in the last two years. Well, thank you so much, Governor. It truly has been a team effort. And throughout this administration, and especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, it's been amazing to see so many business, philanthropic, and nonprofit partners coming to us and saying, how can we help? We have engaged over 196 corporate and philanthropic partners and 748 community-based organizations in our public-private partnership efforts over the past two years that have helped millions of Californians. And it's such a vivid example of Californians who are coming together to support each other during this time of great need. Today, we are so lucky to have a few of those leaders here with us, as well as Californians who have benefited from these partnerships, including Bashara Shuker, the Chief Health Officer at Kaiser Permanente, who has been leading a $63 million partnership to support our statewide contact tracing efforts. John Franco, a contact tracer from San Bernardino, who uh, was unemployed and uh, due to the pandemic and, and got a job through the Kaiser Contact Tracing Partnership. Laureen Paul Jobs, the founder and president of Emerson Collective, who has been such a tremendous advocate on behalf of immigrants in this country and who was one of the first to step up and support the $125 million cash assistance fund for immigrants who were shut out of CARES relief. Emma, who is from San Diego and was a recipient of the Cash Assistance Fund for Immigrants. Darren Walker, the president of the Ford Foundation, who is a leading voice in philanthropy, particularly on racial justice issues. And in this moment, um, with, who has really stepped up with support through a $1 billion social impact bond that the Ford Foundation announced to sustain social impact uh, organizations earlier this summer. Ruth Porat, the CFO of Alphabet and Google, uh, who has been supporting our statewide COVID response efforts in so many ways, including as a member of the Jobs and Economic Recovery Task Force. And finally, Irma Olguin, the CEO and co-founder of Bitwise Industries, also a member of the Jobs and Economic Recovery Task Force, who has been leading innovation in the Central Valley, and in particular, leveraging technology to support those who are looking for jobs during this difficult time with their Onward California uh, platform. So with that, I will turn it back over to you, Governor, to lead us in some questions and answers. I uh, appreciate it. Bashar, let me start with you and thank you again, Kaiser. You've been, you guys have been extraordinary. Sort of every moment we've reached out, Kathleen, others, 
uh, to get help on quarantine isolation strategies, contact tracing, efforts on testing, uh, improving our time to test results, and of course, addressing uh, the deep anxiety we all have around um, uh, just you know, stabilizing the rate of transmission of, of COVID. But I wanna in particular just start with you and, and you know, it's interesting, you know, obviously Kaiser, you guys are another scale, one of the largest healthcare organizations in the, in the world um, and have a history uh, of a philanthropic thrust. But in particular, what is, I mean, when you guys are thinking about your philanthropy and you've been really thinking about ways to align with the state, what, what's, what are the conversations you're having privately in terms of what you're looking for in terms of amplifying? Because one of the things that we're really proud of, it's not just the contributions you guys have all made, but the leverage of state money that has been advanced because your converse, contributions. We are, you are leveraging significantly your philanthropy by getting the state to align with those efforts. But I'm just curious, give us a sense of the conversations you're having in terms of your, your focus, your efforts, your energy as it relates to this moment, particularly around the pandemic and COVID and your philanthropy. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Governor, for uh, having me join this panel. And let me add to your comments about the outstanding, outstanding work that Kathleen does. There are days where I feel like Kathleen and I are on speed dial on so many different issues, and she's always available. She's doing a fantastic job. So let me, let me start there. Um, to, your, to your question, I think it's really important when we think of an organization like Kaiser Permanente that's taking care of 8 million plus Californian with their care and coverage, we truly believe for us to be able to optimize their health, we have to be able to optimize the conditions for health and equity in the communities where those members live. And when we think about our philanthropic approach, it's truly about leveraging partnerships because we know when it comes to lifting the health and well being of communities, there's no one party can do it alone. And it's really about coming to the table with a lot of humility, a lot of curiosity, and trying to build partnerships and connections. And um, so the, the uh, response to the COVID 19 pandemic is a perfect example of how. Um, public, private partnerships, not-for-profit, government, different levels of government can come together and come together to improve the health of all Californians. So I'll, I'll take the contact tracing um, example. You know, I'm a public health person. Contact tracing is one of the most important tools public health has in its toolbox to help stop any type of outbreaks. And local health departments have done contact tracing for decades. And um, if you think about it, somebody tests positive, a contact tracer from the local health department will engage with that person, will counsel them about the importance of isolation, will identify their contacts, will engage their contacts and make sure those contacts are quarantining uh, and tested, quarantining for 14 days and tested. Now, for many of us, being um, you know in quarantine at home for two weeks is no big deal, we can manage to make that happen. But for a lot of us in our communities, being at home for two weeks without income is not something they can afford. You know, there's challenges in finding, putting food at your dinner table. They're challenging even in housing situations. If you're a family of five living in a one bedroom or two bedroom apartment, it might be really hard for you to be able to quarantine safely and not transmit the virus to your household and others. Um, and that's, I think, where we said this is a role that we could play. We could come in, we could partner with the state, partner with local health departments. And that's where we, our board of directors, um, um, approved a $63 million commitment where we're developing these micro teams of folks like John, who'll be talking here in a little bit. Um, um, each team has about 10 folks. We embed those teams virtually in clinical setting and the moment someone tests positive and in partnership with the contact tracers at local health department, will provide all the engagement, all the wraparound services that this person would need so that they can isolate or quarantine safely. They can get to that period of time so that they can, we can stop and break that transmission cycle in our communities and provide the support that those folks are gonna need um, while in quarantine or isolation. We're really excited about this effort. We've launched this effort with you a few, a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago now. 
Um, and we already have four teams in San Bernardino. John is one of our outstanding um, team members in San Bernardino working directly with folks who've been testing positive in their contacts. Uh, we have another team. Uh, the first two team launched back in, um, um, in um, October, two teams launched in November, and we have a team that's gonna be launching in Fresno in early December. So we're really excited about this effort and we're gonna be on a trajectory with our Public Health Institute partner to have all 50 teams up and running in communities that need us the most. So we're really excited about this partnership and thank you, Governor, for allowing us to be part of this effort. I appreciate it. Before I turn over, John, I also wanna just acknowledge you and Blue Shield, you guys stepped up on our Project Home Key as well. And we started something, you know, and, and I can't say it enough because I'm still, I'm just so proud of our teams. Since just since April, we were able to get over 22,000 uh, formerly homeless individuals off the streets since the beginning of this pandemic. 22,000 just since April uh, through the Project Room Key efforts. And that provided not just an isolation room out of a congregate care facility or out from the streets or underpass but also wraparound services. And that's where you guys stepped in to provide and help support some of the county efforts where there was limitations on resources to make sure people got three warm meals a day, every day, tens of thousands of people. And now we've translated it into what we call Project Home Key, where we are able to get $835 million just since July. And we've gotten all that money out and by the end of the calendar year, the state with their county partnerships because of your help and others, we will have secured over 6,000 now permanent units for formerly homeless individuals, unprecedented in our state, I would argue our nation's history. Again, you guys helped inspire those partnerships because it's one thing, again, to get a unit, people then are reticent to even assign themselves any responsibility at the county level unless they know there's going to be support for ongoing services. You helped allow that bridge and helped support that effort. I just, I just need to acknowledge that because the issue of homelessness and COVID and health and social determinants of health are self-evident to anybody watching. But John, you're the real star here, buddy. You, you, you lost your damn job. First of all, you got COVID. You lose your job in July. And then like an act of grace, you're now an expert because you got COVID. You lost a job and you found a better job and now you're a damn contact tracer. Tell us about it. Hello, Governor. Thank you so much, Bashara, of course, for the ability to allow me to support Californians and to really support our communities here on the front lines. As the governor mentioned, um, I was unemployed and I did contract COVID-19 uh, working in volunteer efforts in my community. Um, it was a surprise to me um, when it came, of course, but I wasn't sure I had COVID. So thanks to an initiative by a contact tracer at the county level, they were able to contact me and let me know about my possible exposure. If it wasn't for that contact, I was going to see my mom just a few days later. Mm -hmm. So at that moment, I realized the importance that I practically saved lives in my family and in my household. Uh, after that, I did develop symptoms and I uh, tested positive for COVID. I was able to make a good recovery at home, but I was looking for a job and I was looking for an opportunity to continue working in my community. And the partnership with the Public Health Institute, Kaiser, Bashara, thank you again, allowed me to further expand my knowledge in public health. And at this moment, I'm still signing up for more classes. I'm still taking more opportunities. For example, I'm planning to do a mental health first aid course that's in partnership with Bashara and you know Kaiser and the grant as well. But being at the front lines is so extraordinary because as the governor mentioned, we get to really understand what's happening with people in our communities. For example, I had a call just a few days ago with an individual who had mentioned to me that they hadn't spoken to someone in three months and they have no family, they have no, no uh, friends or anybody that contacts them. So they told me that to have someone actually call them and explain to them the importance of isolation and to ask them how they're doing meant the world to them. It gave them a sense of hope and it gave them a sense of commitment and, and you know, they wanted to continue living. Mm -hmm. And it was so impactful because the person calls me back just yesterday 
And we have that connection where that individual is now doing so much better. I was able to connect them with staff members in our current program and, and connect them with resources that they would have never had the chance to have before. And just being able to offer that frontline support and to ensure Californians and people that we are here to help. We are here to support you. And it may seem like sometimes things might be confusing and it might be overwhelming, but there are so many dedicated people, just as everyone on this panel, that are here to support the communities. Um, of course, it's just been difficult with, with having people understand the importance of isolation. Some people might answer the phone and be like, I don't know who you are. Why are you calling me? How do you know my information? And so forth. But I always tell my clients in my cases, I'm like, hey, um, I'm calling from the health department. If you feel comfortable a little later, here's my number. Go ahead and give me a call when you feel more comfortable. And 90% of the time I get a call back after that. And I'm able to share with individuals the importance of isolation and remind them that we might be okay with dealing with COVID, but there are individuals in our communities who might not have the same abilities like us. And it's always good to remember that we have to think about others those who might have a harder time dealing with this virus on the front lines, but it's been an extraordinary position. I am so grateful and blessed to continue expanding my career in community health. This partnership has opened up so many doors for me, and I'm actually looking forward to promoting again within the Public Health Institute and the Tracing Health Program, all of course in part to the contributions of Bashara, Kaiser, and the governor and state levels. So thank you so much. Well done, John. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for all you're doing. And, and thank you for, I mean, it's remarkable, huh? Just checking in on someone. And we realize how isolated, I mean, even again, pre-pandemic, um, this notion of social isolation in this in current pandemic, this crisis, how impactful just someone who, you know, just checks in and asks how you're doing and just lends an ear. So thank you for reminding us of that power and potency that we all have just to connect with others. Speaking of connecting, someone who's connected people all around the globe, not just here in the state, Lorraine, nice to see you. And thank you for everything you guys are doing. And I, you know, in particular, um, and we're gonna turn it to Emma in a minute, Lorraine, because she's a beneficiary of your incredible support and energy and, and passion uh, to make sure we're here for all people, not just some people. But it's interesting, not everybody in philanthropy wants to get involved in some of the areas you've gotten involved, particularly as it relates to people regardless of their immigration status. A lot of folks will invest in immigration, but the whole issue of documented versus undocumented, and you've made no bones about it. You've been proactive and of course, you inspired this incredible partnership that we advanced with the state where we were able to leverage $50 million of philanthropic money with 75 million of state money, put up 125 million because the CARES Act was nowhere, as Kathleen said, to be found in terms of supporting people like Emma in terms of deep, a desperate time of need in terms of disaster relief. But I'm curious more broadly, not just specific to this philanthropic stuff, but what, what was your inspiration just to commit yourself and your organization to the cause uh, of immigrants, regardless of their immigration status. Um, thank you, Governor. Uh, as you know, immigration reform has long been a personal passion of mine and, and Emerson Collectives as well. I first started working with Dreamers in 2000 through College Track. Um, and I was working with first generation students who were graduating from high school and applying to college. And a, a large percentage of the students I was working with didn't have a social security number. And it was only then that they understood their immigration status. And only then that we started advocating for the passage of the DREAM Act and then further the passage of comprehensive immigration reform. We've been working on it ever since for far too long for changes and justice. Um, but specifically around the, um, the response after the pandemic, uh, when the pandemic hit, we had 11 million undocumented neighbors and colleagues who in our country were left out of the federal response. And we need to remember who we're talking about that the federal government chose to abandon. 
there are five and a half million of the 11 million. So half of the undocumented immigrants in this country are essential workers. 75% of our undocumented neighbors work in essential industries. These are the people, the neighbors and colleagues who are left out of the federal response. Most of them have been living in the United States for over 10 years. So they're deeply rooted in all of our communities. Um, and given what that implied for over 2 million undocumented neighbors living in California, it was an, it, it was an honor for us and an obvious choice for us to participate in the California Immigrant Resilience Fund that, that you spearheaded. And we were really happy to see the state respond where the federal government left off. Um, I think that, that the initiative that California launched was so powerful and sent such an important signal to the rest of the country that, that these are our neighbors, these are our community. We do not let anyone out especially in the middle of a pandemic. It's really, truly some of the most cruel public policy that I've, um, that I've ever witnessed. Uh, but honored as a philanthropic partner to be in partnership with, with the state of California. And then as a result, four other states have, have launched and replicated these funds. So you could see how important that leadership was to the rest of the country. I love that. And I'm curious, just, I mean, when, cause you, you were there, you, you said yes before we even asked um, and you committed to help uh, with others, um, other philanthropists and other organizations. Was it a tough sell? I mean, honestly, did you have conversations that were a little disappointing where people said, I would love to help on that, but not on this one. I don't want to get in the middle of that at the moment. Um, in general, there is not a lot of philanthropy that that is targeted towards specifically to immigrant communities, specifically to protect and defend undocumented communities. Um, and I think that needs to change. Uh, I think that we're going to see a, a, a strong pivot at the federal level. So it will be such a blessing to have a partner at the federal level so that so that uh, comprehensive immigration reform again can be contemplated. Uh, but there are a lot of ways that philanthropists can partner with with local, state, and federal government in in finding justice and getting to a, a humane, uh, common sense immigration law and series of laws. Um, and I can I can kind of walk through some of the examples that have already been uh, initiated and instituted. Um, there's an organization called Fuse, which you may be familiar with because Lenny Mendoza was one of the founders of it. Yeah. And they find they find individuals, they help scope their work, and they they build they have built a community of Americans who are serving in local government for the first time, and that's philanthropically supported. Uh, we ourselves at Emerson piloted uh, some state-based immigrant inclusion positions in four states. And so they work, they work in the governor's office to help soften the soil for, for inclusion and immigrant-friendly policies at the state level. Because as you know, once the federal government does the right thing and reforms our immigration system, it, we have to be organized locally and at the state level in order to make sure that there, there are proper inclusionary practices that happen at the state level. Um, we also, as a response to the election of President Trump four years ago, we incubated what's called the Immigration Hub in DC and it's become the central organizing vehicle for um, many, many hundreds of organizations that are involved in federal immigration advocacy, but also some who aren't in the immigration rights field who just need to understand the messaging, the polling, the policy, the strategy, the resources. Uh, so we were happy to stand that up. It's both a C3 and a C4, and it served a very important need at the time. Well, that's remarkable. Thanks for everything you're doing and your courage 
to to enter in boldly in this space. But again, you know what? I don't think it requires courage. I really don't. Uh, it, it requires listening. It requires compassion. It requires kindness and understanding, but not courage. Well, in this environment, I'm going to argue courage. And uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's been a hell of a four years. And it's it's a good segue yeah. to Emma because, I mean, in this environment, Emma, you, there's a fear, right? I mean, we weren't able to even, the way we set up this fund, we couldn't set it up to in traditional ways where we were sending the money out directly through governmental agencies because of the fear of reprisal, the fear of being turned over to ICE in immigration authorities. We had to develop uh, these partnerships as Kathleen was referring to with community-based organizations. And I think, Emma, you were a beneficiary of one of them, Jewish Family Services, uh, where you were able to get in contact and get one of the uh, support checks or debit cards as it might be, uh, early on in this pandemic. And maybe you can just talk about how you're feeling in this environment um, and how you uh, how you were able to avail yourself to the support uh, that, uh, that uh, clearly, and based upon your wonderful, I, I saw you, you just, you gave us a wonderful quote uh, that uh, sort of warms your heart in terms of what it meant. You said, it's just, you know, grace of God, just, you know, you were able to get that money at a critical time in your life. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Governor, for, ha for having me. And uh, yes, yes, um, Anna, my name is Emma, and I've been living in USA for 25 years. And since I've been living in a resident of California, I've been working as a housekeeper. 2018, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, stage four. I wasn't able to work in 2019. No money. I didn't have money for food, for rent, for nothing to pay my expense. When I hear uh, first on the news, I don't know what news, but I hear something about the mm -hmm. state fund and I say, oh, what is that? I was able to get more information through my community, uh, San Diego Rapid Response. And I got connected to Youth Family Service. And I was um, so happy and I was thinking, I said, was a gift from heaven mm -hmm. because I didn't have money, really. And uh, it was amazing. I was like, really? That is true? I don't have paper. I'm not a comment in person. And yes, I apply. And three days later, four days later, I was receiving a visa card from Family Juice service. And I was like, oh my goodness, happy to have that money with me. Thank you, Mr. Governor, for the, that. Thinking and us for thinking and people like me, undocumented person, for thinking help us. Well, you, you've been helping all of us and, and you're exactly what Lorraine was saying in terms of just your Incredible contribution of decades to, to helping others selflessly. And, and so it's the least we can do. And I think the least we can do, because I'm very cognizant that it's significant $125 million may be, it's not even close to being enough. And I deeply recognize that. And all of us do in terms of the weight of our responsibility to do more and do better uh, for you and, and so many others. How are you, by the way, doing now? How's, how's your health? Oh, perfect. I'm ready to start working. But uh, because the pandemic, well, they don't, they say to my houses, no, don't come. I don't want to expose you. And uh, well, we need another round of stay found like that. <laughs> Maybe some organization help you, help us. But I've been, mm -hmm. uh, since my connection with the uh, family youth service, I've been having food with another organizations, uh -huh, communities. Here, I've been getting some food or some even a little financial for my medications. And I'm still in recovering, but I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Well, God bless you. And uh, we're here for you. And, and without previewing next year's budget, uh, you can count on the fact we'll be doing more. Um, that's the least we can do. So I, uh, I recognize our responsibility to you and, and to others. So thank you. 
Thanks, Alan, for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. And Darren, I, I want to turn over to you. Uh, you've been, I mean, uh, as, as Kathleen said, just, you know, first of all, thank you, Ford Foundation, for giving a damn about California. But I'm not surprised knowing you and the incredible work you've been doing on social justice, racial justice. But, but why, you know, why are you on this call? Because it's a big deal to, to have Ford giving a damn and, and really, you know, a lot of times you look at California, it's such a big state, state and you may decide, I don't know if we can make the biggest impact a state that large. Uh, but I am curious, what, uh, what connects you? And I appreciate your general cause, but what, what uh, connects you to California? And, and, uh, and thank you <laughs> for that connection. But I'm curious, what has prompted so much of your, your support out here over the years? Well, thank you, Governor, for your leadership. And I join in the love fest for Kathleen because she is a rare treasure and I know you appreciate just how special she is. California has always been a geography of opportunity as you Californians know so well, but it's also been for foundations like Ford, a geography of innovation. Mm -hmm. This is a state more than probably any other state and my own governor might not be happy to hear me say this, but California is truly uh, the pioneering state when it comes to innovation, uh, new ideas. And so for the Ford Foundation, if you care about social innovation, you have to be invested in California. And we are lucky because we have partners who do have courage like Lorene Powell Jobs and her colleagues at Emerson. And we have a very competent state government. And let me just say, I am a firm believer in public-private partnerships. The private sector is critical and essential to solving major social problems. But without competent government, the private sector cannot do its work. And so if I'm here, to make a plea, it is certainly to make a plea that we in philanthropy do what Ford and, and Emerson is doing, the corporate partners, the leaders um, at places like Google with my friend Ruth, keep doing it. But without leadership, without competent leadership, we won't see initiatives such as the work that we saw on the California Commission on the Future of Work which for us matters tremendously because if you care about dignity and our mission is a belief in the idea that every person should live with dignity, then you have to care about work. And if you know what we have seen these last few months, I think we all know that the workers who are most vulnerable are like Emma, are like John, and how do we make sure that those workers who are most vulnerable are provided with the social safety net that gives them dignity? So Governor, my hope is that you will continue to let California be California, mm -hmm. to continue to be a path breaking state, continue to generate a policy that is progressive, inclusive, that encourages more philanthropy. And in closing, I will just say, um, the apparatus you have set up that has generated the billions of investment, uh, the, the large numbers that Kathleen recited, there are people gathering in Washington now. And I've heard through the grapevine that some have said, should we look to what the governor has set up in California as a national model to mobilize philanthropy and public-private partnership in a way for impact. So once again, California leads the way. Wow, uh, very kind. And Kathleen, I know I don't need to speak for her. Thank you for your kind words about Kathleen and, and, uh, and the efforts out here. Also, thank you for all your work, hard work on, on behalf of the Future of Work Task Force. It, boy, I mean, little did we know when we conceived of that task force a year ago, 
that so many of the trend lines would be accelerated as they have been through this pandemic in terms of new work styles, new arrangements, telework, and all the vulnerabilities uh, that obviously now are self-evident or increasingly uh, becoming more and more self-evident uh, are being exposed. And so I appreciate that. Darren, just before I let you go and pull over to Ruth, then I just wanna ask you what, you know, when, when you, you talk about public-private partnerships, what remains some of the stubborn issues when you engage with government? I mean, is it, is it is, what, what, what are sort of commonalities of consideration for folks like Kathleen, myself and others, where we can improve our engagement or improve the accessibility or distribution um, or just the partnerships fundamentally between foundations like yours, Lorraine's others, uh, are there common issues that continue to be challenging that can be improved upon? Any recommendations in that space? Absolutely. The one major common challenge in working with government is uh, the disjointed way government agencies often work. And so creating mechanisms that ensure more interoperability, more interagency uh, relationships that facilitate private investment rather than having us have to go one agency to another agency and those agencies often themselves aren't in alignment. Um, that, that uh, and, and I think as Kathleen rightly said, we are seeing that for, for really um, the first time in a long time in California. So kudos to you all. No, that's helpful. I appreciate that. And, and, and again, that's, that's exactly why Kathleen's here is to sort of break down those silos, but it's, it's good to hear that that's foundational in terms of uh, the consideration and focus uh, that needs to frame our efforts. Let me just now frame additional corporate, you know, it's wonderful to have the philanthropic, it's wonderful to have enlightened corporate leadership and Ruth, uh, full disclosure is also like Naren, part of our economic and, and inclusion. We, we have a framework of not just growth, but inclusion. That's our mantra, growth and inclusion. Can't have one without the other. We've focused so much as a nation on growth, not enough on inclusion. And Ruth has been principal and supportive of our efforts over months in that task force. And also um, by extension in terms of helping us with our COVID messaging and helping us reach out to um, you know, connect with people as trusted messengers in a, in a culturally competent bottom-up way. And I just want to acknowledge that, Ruth. And, and, and just ask you is, you know, just in terms of, you know, from a corporate stewardship perspective, you know, how you guys are framing that support, not just in California, obviously we're talking about California, but I imagine all across the country. And also maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the conversations we've been having as of late, as it relates to how we truly can connect more uh, to people in terms of more targeted messaging, the issue of you know how to connect to people, heart and mind, uh, some of the more sophisticated ways that we're looking to engage, particularly on the vaccine distribution, uh, so that we can make sure we're doing justice to reach communities that are often neglected in terms of equity and in the lens of, of, of real engagement. Well, first, thank you so much for having me today. And it was so inspiring to hear all of the work that is being done. You know, at the heart of your question, our view is it's our responsibility to do whatever we can to help in a crisis. And similar to comments already said, you know, where we can work across companies, where we can work in conjunction with smart public policy, our view is that we can have an even greater impact. Or as you said, you know, it amplifies the effort meaningfully. And given the pandemic is attacking both health and jobs, in particular for the most vulnerable in, in our communities, what we immediately did is we said, we wanna focus on areas where we can use our products and our platforms, both to help slow the spread of the disease and to better prepare um, people for the job market. And to your point about messaging, it is so important and it is so core to our mission. Our mission is to organize the world's information, make it universally accessible and useful. And in the midst of a pandemic, the first thing was how do we get quality authoritative information to people? So we created a COVID homepage, we linked to authoritative data sources. And then what we're really proud of with your team and state agencies who were so out in front, we wanted to get out the safety message, wear a mask, socially distance and contact trace. And these are so important, you know, great that we're seeing a vaccine on the horizon, but the first thing we knew is we could make a big difference. And so really appreciated 
working cl closely with your team on that. We also looked at how we could leverage our MAPS platform, given its reach, to really help people who are trying to figure out where do I go to get tested. And so we were proud to be able to donate ad placement to magnify, amplify the message, you know, whether it was on Google search or on YouTube. But very much to comments that others have already made, for the message to get through clearly does take alignment with policymakers. And thankfully in California, there has been really clear ongoing alignment with your health officials, with scientists, with policymakers. And so we were able to get the message out, although dealing with headwinds, because obviously that wasn't the case elsewhere in the country. And it was frustrating that wearing a mask became a political statement, uh, given it's clearly one of the simplest tools to help slow the spread of the disease. So very, very grateful to everything that you've been leading here. On the jobs front, we immediately focused on what can we do to help small, medium businesses? And this isn't a new focus for us at Google. Our view is that small and medium businesses are the backbone of the economy. And so years ago, we developed a digital skills training program called Grow with Google. And the intent is to provide free training for small, medium businesses and individuals. And you can Google it for any of you who are interested in signing up for it. Uh, it's a free program, as I said. But um, pre-COVID, what we saw is that small businesses that adopted digital skills had an uplift in their financial performance. What was really striking as you went into COVID is it became critical for survival. Uh, about one in three small businesses said that if they did not have digital tools, they would have had to close all or part of their business. Yeah. So one of the things that we're, we're very proud of um, working with the task force was partnering with local and state leaders across California in Los Angeles, Modesto, San Francisco, San Jose, and looking at how we could leverage the Grow with Google program and facilitate free training in English and in Spanish for small uh, business owners. But you know, very much to your question, it's like, what can each of us do with our platform, our resources uh, to be able to be of help here? I love that. And I'm just curious with, from where you're sitting, I'm in my, I think, I was a mantra when I was growing up with my father and mother, but I always said, the answer is no, unless you ask, uh, which is a wonderful way of sort of looking at life generally. Um, so you don't have much risk in hearing a no um, when you ask, because it's by definition, no, unless you ask. But I'm curious, just, you know, when you think about Kathleen, myself, and just government generally at every level, uh, local, not just state, or even a national level, um, in terms of approaching someone like yourself, a, a company as large as <laughs> is, is Google, um, what any any advice in terms of the pathways? And, uh, you know, because you, you you don't want to overindulge. You know, we're always you know it's like never ending and enough's enough. And and I worry about you guys. You know, doing so much for California, then you're going to get every other state saying you need to do more for us, and then other countries. Uh, you guys have a whole different. You know, you're just you're, you're not just a local mom and pop and you know, in, in Redwood City, uh, that's just gonna be Redwood City focused. But any advice in terms of, you know, how we continue to engage you? I hate to put you on the spot. Like no, I think it's a really important question. I, you know, I'm gonna answer it in two ways. First, I do think every company needs to understand that we have a responsibility to build a better future. And I think that it's not just the right thing to do, but actually a sustainable, durable, equitable economy actually leads to a better long-term financially healthy environment. So, you know, start with that is one important point. Uh, but more specifically to your question, when we look at the asks coming in and they do come from across the country and around, around the world, uh, you know, an important part of it is what is, what can we really do that's differentiated? Leveraging our content, our platforms, what is true to us? And so the reason I wanted to hit on what we did with respect to information and your prior question about, well, what can we do on the vaccine? There will be a lot of bad information people try and get out there on vaccines. And so we're really focused on how do we make sure that we're delivering authoritative, high quality information that's the most helpful, the most responsible, and how do we invest in everything we can to make sure we deliver that content and really amplifying the message about wear a mask, socially distance, that's true to who we are. Digital skills training and really helping this generation get ready for the jobs of today and tomorrow is core to who we are. And so I think the ask resonates when it enables us to leverage what we're really good at. And, um, and that's the way we try and work with your teams and they've been extraordinary in that regard. 
No, I love that. I appreciate it. Thank you for, for that insight. And let me just, and I'm very mindful of everybody's time. And again, thank you all for taking so much of your valuable time uh, for this conversation. Irma, best for last, Bidwise, Central Valley. Uh, and most folks know Irma, those that don't, uh, rock star that's, it, you know, just highlighting the, the Central Valley in a way that it hasn't been highlighted necessarily at scale in the past. Uh, the Central Valley is very proud of its roots and history as a breadbasket to the world. And that's a point of differentiation and deep pride, not just for the Valley, but for me, for all of us as Californians and as Americans. But it's also uh, this remarkable innovative region as well with incredibly young, uh, regardless of time of life, this incredible talent pool uh, that's there and just waiting to be engaged and asked and uh, incorporated in a broader vision. And, and that's what Irma has been doing for some time and uh, working with Onward California, working with a lot of our initiatives, uh, again, sort of bottom up and really uh, exercising uh, some remarkable success that's been now scaled in other parts, not just in Fresno, but other parts of Central Valley. Irma, I'd love to talk a little bit about what you're doing and, and, and how philanthropy and a philanthropic thrust and social innovation is playing a big role of your growth and success and the success in the Valley. Yeah, thanks governor. And, and thank you, Kathleen too. I remember those conversations over donuts during the transition talking about, you know, could this could this exist at a high level in the governors at the state? And um, so happy to see you doing this and really just knocking it out of the park. I um, and I'm joining your fan club right after this. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, the Central Valley is a challenged place, right? I think that we, all, everybody on this call knows that um, when you are thinking about the technology industry and when you're thinking about folks who are um, uh, climbing out of poverty, uh, you're typically not thinking about the Central Valley. If you're looking for the best grape or the best almond or the best pistachio, you're for sure looking in our direction. And that's something that we're looking to change. We have um, a lot of underserved and overlooked talent in the heart of the state. Um, and we have been able to, in the last seven, almost eight years, prove that um, those folks uh, coming from that story are just as likely to succeed in the technology industry and help us rebuild this economy um, as anyone else. We go toe to toe with literally anybody else in the world in terms of technology talent building, I'm not kidding you, the most diverse technology workforce probably anywhere in the world and being the largest educator of computer programmers, uh, vocational educator of computer programmers in the United States is a real feather in the cap uh, for the Central Valley. And so folks looking to us for their talent needs uh, going forward, especially in this sort of new digital age that we've all been thrust into as a result of COVID, um, there's no shortage, there, there are no shortage of folks who are leaving their cafe barista jobs and skilling now into the technology industry, um, moving from essentially the lower third of the economy to the upper third of the economy. And so I think what um, has been really important in working with you, Governor, and, and all the really wonderful folks at the state uh, during the last couple of months here is that there's alignment in what we believe we're signing up for in the future. What does the recovery look like if we dare to dream? Um, and for us, it looks like a new, equitable, inclusive technology workforce. And not, of course, just technology, but that is our competency. Um, and being able to say, yeah, you know, our technologists are in fact 50% female or gender nonconforming. Uh, they are, in fact, 50% minority, as is representative of the counties that we serve. Um, we are 24% first generation. And so being able to take that and replicate, sort of copy and paste that model up and down the Central Valley and other places where we might have an impact in California has been really, really wonderful in working with the state and other uh, large uh, philanthropic entities to expand the work. Um, one of the things that we did as a response to COVID, as you well know, is work on Onward in conjunction with the k Center out of Oakland um, and the new governor to sort of create a COVID response site and platform that connected folks, not just to jobs, which is always helpful, but also to life essential resources. Where do I go for a food pantry uh, connection? Where do I go if I need transportation tokens? Where do I go if I need help with childcare? And Onward was an answer and is an answer to that. And then being able to say that this was born and raised in California has been a model for now the other 15 states that we're a part of, largely because they were looking at California and saying, if this is what a public pri private partnership looks like, sign us up. So how do we get involved uh, with not just onward, but, but private entities in the way to really think about 
uh, that recovery and what we're signing up for in the near term here. And so it's been a really, really wonderful experience to get to know larger parts of your team, to work with a number of folks on this call. Um, as we think about that future that we're signing up for, what are we doing today that, that sort of bakes it equity into that formula? So it's not a surprise on the other side of this, right? We're not suddenly trying to sprinkle some diversity over the top of it, but instead it actually becomes part of the fabric of, of who we are. These are our friends and neighbors. They are also signing up for a recovery. We are um, excited to be the sort of steward of that in the Central Valley. I love, I love all that. And, and I, I, um, I've been bragging on you ever since I had that privilege a few years back to uh, stumble upon your extraordinary, uh, well, your first location uh, yeah. when you're just 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 getting this thing started. It's just wonderful to see your growth and expansion. And and I think you know one of the things we've heard sort of across the spectrum, uh, success leaves clues. And I and I love sort of the the connected tissue to this notion of social innovation. And Darren, the spirit that you brought uh, from the national prism in terms of why you look to California and. And Lorraine, it relates to how other states were inspired by your good work and the disaster assistance grants, regardless of status. And obviously, Irma, what you're doing and, and obviously Google's spirit and, and incredible leadership and stewardship that is Kaiser connects all of us together. And so uh, I really, again, appreciate all of you and everything you're doing to, um, you know, to, as I say, I'm over, over use the phrase, but to meet this moment head on. Uh, it has been a tough year in every way, shape or form. Uh, and we're getting through this with a more resilient mindset and more capable than ever as we turn the page and into the new year and uh, into uh, our recovery. And so thank you guys for, for joining. And Kathleen, let me just turn it back to you. And again, I just, it was wonderful to hear all the wonderful things said about you. Uh, and I just wanna again, congratulate you on inspiring all of this and, and working so hard to generate uh, all of this support and, and build uh, on all the success and the incredible philanthropic um, mindset that's uh, demonstrable, not just on this screen, but throughout this state. And so Kathleen, thanks again for all your leadership. Well, thank you so much, Governor. Um, and to everyone, I'm blushing, <laughs> um, but, but truly this is a team effort and it's um, thanks to all of you, to all of our agency partners who have opened uh, their arms to partnerships like never before and to our community-based organization partners uh, in communities around the state. Innovation isn't just happening in, in you know, Silicon Valley and uh, entertainment industry in Los Angeles. It's happening in every community around our state. And it's our job to find those great ideas that we can bring to scale. And particularly as we look towards 2021, um, and continued pandemic response, we need to do more. Um, we need to do more on racial justice. We need to do more on climate change. And we're really excited to lean into partnerships even deeper. And we hope that all of you will join us uh, and look forward to continuing these great efforts. You're here. Again, uh, humbled that you all took the time to be here. It's a big deal. You're all a big deal. And, uh, and thank you for giving a damn. Thank you for stepping in. Thank you for supporting John Franco. Thank you for supporting Emma. Thank you for supporting hundreds of thousands of others that uh, have been directly a recipient of, of your values uh, made real and all of your entrepreneurial and innovative energy, not just your philanthropic support. Thank you guys. It's a real pleasure to be with you all today. Take care. <laughs>